so everyone good afternoon everyone hello i think uh, we don't i need don't need to introduce myself since i got introduced already and uh, there are no more strangers here so today uh, we are going to have a very very interesting session for the next uh, one and a half hours i promise you that it will be really very interesting i was told that uh, i cannot walk around because apparently the microphone should work so i may walk around and switch on your microphones as i go okay so <laughs> right so we are going to be on a very interesting topic on causality assessment for eefis and what we are going to be learning together today is how to do causality assessment we are going to learn it in three independent steps okay the first step number 1 what we are going to be doing is we are going to be actually uh, i am going to give you a theory session for about 30 minutes Uh, to forty-five minutes, okay, thirty to forty-five minutes, where I'm going to do, unfortunately, most of the talking. Right. <laughs> Then the next part of it, what is going to happen is we are going to have one of the volunteers, and I understand the Ritu here is going to lead the discussions today on a sample case. Okay. And then the third part of the session is you are going to do the causality assessment for a hypothetical case yourself. Okay. Now I want to underline one very very important thing. The aim of this exercise is not to be accurate. It is to understand the process. Okay. We are not at all interested in the answer. We are more interested in you understanding the process and also clarifying certain questions which will come up when you do causality assessment yourself. And also we will also understand about. the different steps its applications and also the pitfalls let me also tell you something like yesterday when i was when i was talking one of the things i mentioned was that there are several causality assessment methods the reason for that is none of them are perfect including the method which i am going to show you it is not perfect okay it has been developed with a lot of uh, work in fact uh, one of the persons who developed it is also in the room here edwin asturias Okay, we were all, we were all in the group that kind of worked on this method together. Okay, so let's start off the story. In fact, I really wish that the video was there because that would have kind of uh, kept you in an unbiased state of mind. One of the most important things. Well, let me tell you what the video was about. It was supposed to have a very to keep your mind totally neutral when you do causality assessment. Because what happens is many of the times when you start the assessment, you go back with a pre-existing bias. Is it clear that to keep your mind totally neutral is something very very important which you have to do. Now, let's see the 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 first version. What you what what I'm going to tell you now is there has been considerable progress even between uh, last year when we did this assessment when uh, when we did this training. In fact. i was here last year in the same hall conducting the same training between last year and this year there has been an update and that is we have actually developed an e learning course here okay so what you are seeing here you can actually register i'll show you how to access the e learning course using the software you can access it and you can learn not only the software not only how to do causality assessment but also how to use the software so these things you can learn yourself now when you look at this let us start off the story in the beginning You know, yesterday I told you the definition of an adverse event following immunization. Can any of you remember what it is? Let me start off by giving you a hint. It's a very rare occurrence which follows immunization, but which does not necessarily have a causal relationship with the usage of the vaccine. Now, this definition is actually very, very important from the causality assessment perspective. Okay, this is very, very critically connected to causality assessment question. particularly the second part of the definition so in other words the adverse event has to be a sign symptom lab finding or disease so if you just look at this it can be a symptom like what i said it can be some it can be an itching it can be a cough it can be anything it can be a sign like what you see there is ictus it can be a enlarged liver it can be uh, uh, something like you know an inflamed in the throat anything it can be it can be a lab finding like what i told you yesterday like uh, thrombocytopenia ecg changes mri changes can be a disease like you know purpura or meningitis or whatever it is now and i told you this one i'm not going to repeat this the reason why we are happy that we are not using this i also explained yesterday so i'm not repeating the same thing today now this is something very very interesting okay do you, how many people are regulators here 
One, two, three. Have you seen this before? What is it? Twice what is it? Perfect. It was done for medicines. Okay. Now, originally, before uh, 2012 to 2013, the same method was actually used for vaccines. For medicines, this was the causality assessment, which is used even now. This is the WHO method, which is used even now. So, what you look at is, you look at it in two angles, okay, on, on two dimensions. This is on one axis. If this is the onset of a year time, okay, and here this is actually time, and that is alternate explanations. So, when you look at time, and if it is an, if you, if there is going to be, if it is compatible with time, then you will, and if there is no other alternate explanation available for that particular event, you will call it certain and the event is related to the exposure of the particular medicine or the drug. Is it clear? Now, as you move outwards, it moves from compatible to incompatible. So, it moves from certain to probable. Again, if there is alternate explanations might have been there, it becomes probable. And then, if again, if it is alternate, there are alternate explanations, it becomes possible. Then it becomes unlikely. Then it goes into, if it goes beyond this, it is unrelated. And then it is also, if it doesn't fit into any of this, it is classified as unclassifiable. Now, this particular system was originally used for medicines. And in fact, I, in 2009, when I was first trained on causality assessment, this was the med system which was in vogue at that time. Now, problem was, I, I remember, you know, in that particular meeting, many people came in as friends, fought and went out as enemies. Okay. <laughs> because they were not able to agree on so many things. Okay. Now, what happened was, there was also, there was other issues which we, which we, why? Because people are not able to differentiate very well between probable and possible. That created a lot of disagreement. Understand? There was also another issue. See, you should understand, unlike medicines, vaccines is a very sensitive issue and mostly in the public domain. It's so everybody is looking at it. In COVID and all, you must have been there. So if you just look at, I think many of you are from different uh, countries and you have different languages, right? Now, if you just try to translate probable and possible, in my language, you know, I'm, I speak Malayalam and I speak Tamil and all, but then I'm not able to translate it into uh, into a perfect level. It becomes very difficult for us to translate. So because of that, only this particular new classification came up. Now, this is an important definition which has actually come up. And that is, you know what? The, the, there is, this is, uh, when you look at causality and causality assessment, what is causality? Causality is the relationship between two events, the cause and the effect, where the second event is a consequence of the first. Okay? So, there is a cause, like you introduce a vaccine or you introduce a medicine and there is an event which occurred and the, the second event is a consequence of the first and that is actually causality. Now, when you make this assessment, you are trying to determine if this relationship exists between the cause and the effect. You are trying to determine if this relationship exists and if you want to know to what extent the relationship exists. Is it clear? So, that is, the, that is causality assessment. Now, what is most important is that a direct cause is in the absence of, the, of which the effect would not occur. Let me give you an example. Now, you know what? Let us say I'm actually uh, in the, it's evening, night time here in uh, Amnesty. Okay. So yesterday night, for instance, I came out, there was like certain drying pieces of that on the table, right? I drank it. And then as I walked out, walked out of this place, the lights went off. Okay. And then there was a car which came and, and I was walking on the road, putting my headphones on and I was listening to music. And then I was going on the lake side, but then since the, I had an effect of the wine, I got out and I went to the road. And it was totally dark, there were no lights, a car without the lights come and hit me and I died. Okay, let's assume lights. And what caused my death? Which one? The accident, okay, what else? The wine contributed. Wine contributed, okay. The headphones. The headphones. The headphones does need to use it, yeah. Anything else? The darkness. But you guys are missing the main point, actually. You know what? Actually, the cause of death. You see, I asked about the cause of death. What, what actually killed me? It is actually the shock and the hemorrhage which actually killed me. You understand? So, when you are looking at causality assessment, this is an important concept to understand. Okay. 
So the direct cause is the absence in which the effect would not occur. So what we mean here is the shock, the fact, the fact that I went into him internal bleeding, that is what actually caused the death. All the other things what you see are cofactors which effect which in to which the event has occurred. Did you understand? Yes. So when so when you are doing causality assessment. Trying to find out the underlying cause is the critical thing in doing this assessment. So the the store the, the underlying principle or the philosophy here is you should create the correct causality question. If you ask the wrong question, you will get the wrong assessment. Is it clear? So if you ask the question, did Madhav put the headphones and did he die because of listening to music? You will not get the right answer. You understand? So the 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 end, so if you have understood this particular concept, I'm sorry, I, I can actually walk out of the door. <laughs> you understand causality assessment, half your problems are over. Because let me tell you something, when that's in real life, trying to create this causality question is not easy. It's extremely difficult. Because yeah, at the end of the day, you can debate, you, know, you can have a causality assessment committee sitting here and they'll debate for half an hour to one hour, trying to choose which question to put there. Because for this, I'm going to explain to you what is the meaning of the word valid diagnosis. Yes. Okay. So if, if the shock and the hemorrhage was the cause of your death, but we don't put the shock and the hemorrhage in jail... We put the driver of the car in jail. Ah, exactly. So, that is a that is we can have a debate about okay, that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. You understand what I mean? We can have a debate about. But that, that was the cause of the cause. Cause. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Because those are the four factors which actually because basically you are asking yourself what really caused the death. What is the okay. underlying cause? Okay? okay. That is important. Right. Now this is something you have to keep in mind. Now, why are we doing this? Why exactly are we doing this? We are trying to avoid, we are trying to avoid, we're doing the systematic causality assessment to avoid concluding that the event happened after vaccination, therefore it happened because of vaccination. Technically speaking, ideally what you should do is you should take a population, divide them into a vaccinated group and, an, uh, and a control group, follow them up, and if the incidence among the your unvaccinated group is then you need to find out is it greater or is it lesser and then if the incidence among the vaccinated group is greater then you would say that there is a connection between the vaccine and the adverse event but the biggest problem with this is you cannot do randomized trials in post-marketing surveillance number one and in many countries like if you just look at it except in a few countries like if you look at Sri Lanka and all you have an organization coverage of about 95 to 100 percent Right? So you cannot actually get a comparator group. So it becomes very difficult for you to make comparisons. So this is a big problem. It cannot also be large enough to detect the thing. Now, one of what I'm going to talk to you today is actually taken out from this particular book. Okay. It's this book came out, this formed the basis of your present causality assessment methodology that actually formed the framework. So in 2012, this book came out. And this book, this particular thing was endorsed by everybody, by all uh, people like, you know, Brighton Collaboration Regulatory Agencies and IVB and all these people. And that is how the, and based on these definitions, it started off. Now it has evolved. The first version actually came out. This one came out in 2013. This is when we conceptualized it. In 27, 2017, we actually had something called an indo Zimbabwe study. And during the Indo-Zimbabwe study, what we did was we validated this method. What we did was, have you heard of something called an inter-rater agreement, right? So we wanted to find out whether we're supposing two groups of people were supposed to do this assessment, how much will they agree? Not that honestly this agreement was nothing great, but by and large it is better than nothing. You understand what I mean? So that is what it was. Now the new new thing is right now we have reached a stage where it's really been used quite extensively and it is used in many countries all over the world. In fact, the software which I'm which I'm going to demonstrate is being translated into seven UN languages because it has been used so extensively. So what we're going to be learning in the next few, uh, next 30 minutes is we'll explain what is causality assessment. There are four steps in the causality assessment methodology. 
then we are going to uh, understand the practical aspects of causality assessment and also how we will do it in special situations. That's what we will be doing. Because yesterday, even during uh, coffee and all, people come back and ask me, what if there are, like, you know, yesterday in the plenary, there was a gentleman who asked, no, what happens if multiple vaccines are given at the same time and things like that. So we will address those questions as well. So let's first of all look at what do we mean when we say that a vaccine causes an adverse event? At a population level, we are just trying to find out, did the vaccine increase the occurrence, is the risk of occurrence of the event in the community, in the whole community. So for this, we are just trying, this is what we call as vaccine attributable risk. You know, you are trying to introduce it into the community and say, this vaccine can cause adverse events at the rate of 1 per 100,000, like DTS at 1 per 100,000. Now, individual one was, was the vaccine, was the vaccine a factor in the individual developing the event? That is what it is, okay, in the individual. Now, today, what we are going to be doing is we are going to be focusing on the individual level. Get this individual, get the causality assessment. And let me tell you honestly, most of the time, it's very difficult to pay that. Very, it's only, in fact, yesterday we were talking about this, and then you were also saying many of the classifications come out as indeterminate. You understand? But that is kind of natural, it, unless we have evidence. Now, this is an important slide, and I showed this yesterday also, but I want to go through this in a little bit of detail here. Now, what happens is the place where the orange arrow takes place, where it takes place, where, where when a person gets vaccinated, that is when, you know, your, that is the interface where the patient or the little comes in contact with the vaccinator. And as I said, usually there are a few questions which are, what is the exchanges which take place there? What happens when a mom, if I'm a man, and if I'm going to a vaccinator, what is expected from the vaccine? Can okay, you tell me? Before giving a vaccine? Uh, expected about the like possible side effects of vaccine. Absolutely right. Anything else? And if something's happened, what is it? Absolutely right. Anything else? Um, we'll also talk about what the vaccine is going to protect against. Yeah. Right? Whom to approach in case. And also the fourth thing which you also do is when to come for the next dose. So these are the four things which you normally advise among expects or a dad or a patient expects from the vaccinator. Now, when this information is obtained, you are telling the patient what to do when, uh, when an event takes place. So, you, so only two things can happen here. An event may take place or an event may not take place. If an event takes place, again, only two things can happen. One, the person will remember, oh, you know what, when I vaccinated, the vaccinator told me to do this. But now, but many other times, then they will just ignore it, especially if it is minor. But then if it becomes quite serious, if it becomes something which the person is concerning this particular person, then, sorry, if it concerns this particular person, then what happens is it is brought to the notice of the health system. That is what we call as notification. Now, when you talk about the notice of the health system, it can be anybody. It can be a health field level health worker, a nurse, a pharmacist, a doctor, or anybody it can be. And that is when the reporting takes place. Now, when you talk about what is the meaning of that word reporting and how is it different from the word notification, when you look at the word notification, you are bringing it to the notice of the health system. When you talk about reporting, you are talking about using a piece of paper and filling it up. You understand? You are creating a small report and that report should not be detailed. It is containing only 25 core variables. It contains only 25. I wish I had brought, uh, there was a picture of the reporting form. I have not shared it yet with you guys. But then when you look at it, there is only 25 core variables. And then the report actually gets filled up with the minimum amount of information. What is the purpose of reporting? The purpose of reporting is to identify an event as an event is, in which place, which vaccine, and what is the type of event. That's all. And for that, it does not need high level sophisticated knowledge. It can be done by a lay person. You understand? So, now, once it is reported, it is then going and then it is categorized into two categories. I explained this yesterday. It is divided into serious and non-serious. Do you remember what serious is? Death, hospitalization, disability, congenital anomaly, or, uh, excess, uh, or any other medically significant event. So, these are the five categories which, fill, which comes up as a serious adversity. Now, what happens is, so there is a reporting which takes place. Now, once it is reported to the next level, the person sitting as a supervisory level from here, okay, the guy, so the, sorry, the person who actually sits here as a supervisor to this person will say certain cases need to be investigated. Now, what do you mean by the word investigation? 
when you when we, what we mean by the word investigation is we are actually asking them so to actually fill up a particular form called the AEFI investigation form. I'm going to be shared with you an investigation form very soon during the session. It's actually pretty elaborate. Okay, it consists of four pages usually. And then it contains a lot of interesting details. So this is what, what happens in this thing. And plus, in addition to this, it also, we ask them to collect all the clinical details of the patient. The patient might be admitted in the hospital, autopsy reports, community investigation, field investigation, etc. So when you talk about a field, and this is a real investigation which took place in Ghana. And in fact, we do, do during one of our trainings, this was conducted. We, we make them visit the health center, collect all the details of that particular case. So, so the investigation remain a uh, cause on a life list? No, it is actually a field visit where you collect all the details okay, from the field. Understand? So that is a field visit. Now, again, the investigation, since you asked this particular question, investigations are divided into two categories. Uh, concise investigations and comprehensive investigations. Concise investigations are done when you are pretty straightforward cases. Like, you, for instance, if there is febrile seizures after measles vaccine, for instance, if time is admitted in the hospital, it is a serious case. We don't really need to make a field investigation for that. But if there is a death, then you need to have a field investigation. You understand? So that is again divided into two categories. Now, what you then next stage is analysis. Now, what is done here is the data collecting from the reporting is actually put into a line list. I told you there is 25 core variables here that is put into a line list. It is actually analyzed. And then that particular data, they look at it in terms of time, place, and person to identify patterns occurring in certain districts. Is it clear? So that is what we do. Then the next stage is a stage among the serious cases which have been investigated. You are actually, what you are doing is you are actually doing a causality assessment. And when you are doing, sorry, uh, sorry about that. That's uh, causality one minute. I know what this, this is completely confusing for me. Yeah? Sorry about this laptop. I mean, my laser pointer works the other way. That's the problem. Okay. So, so when you look at this, so what we do is we, uh, when you analyze the particular data, when you look, so this is a stage of data analysis. Serious AEFI cases, which is investigated, goes for causality assessment. So causality assessment is not done for all cases. Only for cases which are, which are investigated, you will do causality assessment. Okay, so this is one thing. Now, there is, this is something which we saw yesterday. No, I'm not going to repeat the same story again. So let us just go to it. This is a vaccine product related reaction, quality defect related reaction, which is a cutter incident. This is an immunization error related reaction. This is an immunization anxiety related reaction. And this is a coincidental event, right? Now, this is connected to causality assessment. I want you to watch the screen carefully because there is an animation. Okay. This is a very important part of the step which you have to understand. So if you just look at it, can you see this? Do you agree? So there are five uh, five types of AEFI. All of you agree? Now let's look at it moving. So and then, something, for something that, for example, has called it and then that expired, that's done, okay? We'll have how much time to have a result of the We will discuss that later. Right? So what, what is it? Sorry? Oh yeah, I, I, it's my mistake. It should have been immunization stress related responses. Okay. Okay, let me just go back then. Uh, so if you let us, so we are starting from here. Okay. And then we are going into this because this understanding this animation is quite important. Now, when you look at the cost specific type of AEFI, it is connected to causality assessment classification. I have brought it from the previous page here. Do you agree? So, when you look at the causality assessment classification, there is two ends of the spectrum. One end of the spectrum is consistent causal association to immunization. What is the meaning of that? It means the vaccine or the vaccination was responsible for the adverse event. Let me repeat what I said. The vaccine or the vaccination was responsible for the adverse event. So, from here, on the other end of the spectrum, you are having something called inconsistent causal association immunization, which means the vaccine or the vaccination was not responsible for the adverse event. Agreed? Right. Now, let's look at this one. The first one, vaccine product related reaction. What was responsible? The vaccine was responsible for that dose. So it definitely is consistent for that. When you look at the second one, when you look at the vaccine quality defect related reaction, again, 
the vaccine was responsible for that person. You agree? Right. Now, when you look at the next one, you are having immunization error related adverse event. Okay, so this is again the environment or the place where the, the vaccination process was responsible for the adverse event. And then you're having the immunization anxiety related adverse event. Again, the ambience of the room, the stress, everything caused immunization. So the first one, what you see in the boxes in that here in orange, here the vaccine was responsible. Okay, so it is a vaccine reaction. Okay, whereas if you look at the next one, here it is a vaccination process which was involved in the adverse event. Right? Now, the other end of this is an AEFI that is coincidental. It could be an underlying or emerging conditions or condition caused by exposure to something other than the vaccine. To put it in ordinary English, what does it mean? It can be an influence factor coming out or an extrinsic factor coming in. Okay? Now, yesterday, you remember, I gave you two examples. One example about that Natalie Morton, that lady, you know, who had a, who developed a media standard tumor. So that is an intrinsic factor coming out. Is it clear? Now, yesterday I also gave you an example of the, uh, the uh, Cassia Occidentalis, where somebody took this one and then you developed a problem. So that is an extrinsic factor getting in. So this is the two things which actually manifest itself. Then you are having something which is actually called indeterminate, which comes between the two. This is something you have to understand. Now, what happens here in indeterminate is you are not able to put it here in consistent causal association. You are not able to put it here in inconsistent. It comes in between. There are two categories in indeterminate. What is the first one? Let me first read it out and then I will explain in ordinary English. The first is that is temporal relationship is consistent, but there is insufficient definitive evidence for vaccine causing the event. It may be a new vaccine linked event. Let me give you an example. I introduced a particular new vaccine. Let us say I introduce a vaccine for dengue. Can I come in Right? Now, when I introduce this particular vaccine in, in a community, I start getting reports after about one or two weeks after the new vaccine is introduced. I got to get reports about alopecia. People are losing their hair. Okay? In one particular, I introduced it in a, in a pilot in a particular province and at that time, people are losing their hair. Now, what is happening? You will initially will be classifying it as here because you will have to classify it as temporal relationship consistent. That means after the event occurred after the vaccine was given, but there is insufficient evidence that the vaccine caused the event. Why? When you investigate it, you might find that the place where you introduced it might, that might have been near one factory uh, releasing arsenic into the water, causing hair loss. You understand? So in which case, you will have to change the classification. Is that clear? So that is something you have to keep in mind. That is the first one. The second one which you have to keep in mind is that there is qualifying factors result in conflicting trends of consistency and inconsistency with causal association to immunization. Sounds complicated, no? It is not. Okay? So conflict, the qualifying factors result in conflicting trends of consistency and inconsistency. What does it mean? It means there is an equal chance of it being consistent and an equal chance of it being inconsistent. Let me give you an example. I introduced a, a vaccine, measles vaccine in a dengue endemic area. Okay. Now I get thrombocytopenia. Now the thrombocytopenia can be because of the dengue vaccine, dengue within the community, or it could be because of the measles vaccine. So it could be either it can be consistent or there's an equal chance of it being inconsistent. So in that case, I'll be putting it as your the, the entire thing as B2. So that's it, ladies and gentlemen. The main part of the class is over. Okay. You can give a sigh of relief. If you no, understood this. So that means it's caused on the but why is it not uh, inconsistency? Because you're vaccinating in a dengue endemic area. See, the dinghy also can cause thrombocytopenia, right? Yes. So you don't, you can, you, you have an equal chance of putting it as a vaccine or a related reaction mm -hmm. or a coincident event because of dinghy. Mm -hmm. So now, because they're not sure, you decided to put under B2, mm -hmm. under, right? So now what we also get is something called unclassifiable. So sometimes, let me tell you, not sometimes, several times, okay. you <laughs> classify and come and look at all this classification. You can still find that the case is only unclassifiable. 
Okay, in that case, you'll have to specify what additional information is required for classification. Okay, so that is what it is. Now, with this, when you look at it for reporting, now when you look at AEFI cases, you need to look at cases which you talk about for reporting and also for investigation. So serious AEFI cases, as I said, should be reported. And when you report serious AEFI cases, you should always remember the reporter should not assess causality. Why? Because it has to be done by an expert. It is not like, you know, a reporter cannot call it a vaccine product related reaction. It has to be somebody who really knows the stuff who can actually answer that particular question. Now, so it is, as I said, you should report all cases that are brought to the notice of the health system, complete the reporting form. Now, when you look at for, for formal causality assessment, all serious AEFI cases you have to do, you, uh, this is, I already explained what that was. You should do it for clusters. You should, if you suspect signals, you should do it. And also other AEFI, especially if you suspect immunization error, sometimes even if it is considered minor, even significant events of unexplained cause, if that also causes parental, uh, parental or community concerns, they also should be selected for causality assessment. Before doing a causality assessment, you know what? You should look at it. You should make sure that the AEFI investigation should have been completed. Depending on time, I will tell you how to do the investigation. Okay. I've got a slide on that, but I'm not presenting it. So all details of the case should be available at the time of assessment and there must be a valid diagnosis. I will explain what this, so what is this valid diagnosis? It is, you know, a valid diagnosis. You remember I told you, you know, when I, if I met with the death, you have to write out one year time. So the cause of death is actually the valid diagnosis. Is it clear? So that is what it is. So when you look at the, at the time of causality assessment, what are the things you need? You need a case report form, investigation form, clinical case record, lab reports, autopsy reports, and for blank causality assessment worksheets. So now I'm actually going to share with you some blank causality assessment worksheets with which we can actually proceed and discuss in detail. So can you please share this? Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Everyone wants one of these? There's a volume, okay? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Now, so we want to look at this worksheet for causality assessment. And it's important for you to understand this worksheet for causality assessment. Now, if you look at that worksheet in front of you, there are two pages, right? So if you look at the first page, the first page actually talks about the eligibility criteria. Okay, so there are four steps in causality assessment. The first step is actually the stage of eligibility. Now, if you just, so then, then the next stage, if you just see, is a stage of checklist, event checklist. If you look at it, there is a series of questions which are put up there. And it is divided under four primary categories. Right? Now, if you look at the primary category one, can I have your attention on the screen, please? Because there is an animation. So, if you look at the, so this is the second step. Now, the third step is actually the algorithm. There is an algorithm. And then the fourth step is actually the classification. Right? Now, look, if when you look at the screen, there is a connection between the questions on the checklist and the algorithm. So, if you can just turn the page, you will find that the first question is there strong evidence for other causes? It is connected to the first box of the algorithm. You see? Then the second question which you which you come across is, is there a known association with vaccine or vaccination? Okay? And that is connected to the second box of the algorithm. If you look at this, okay, it is categorized into questions connected to vaccine product related, Quality defect related immunization error and immunization anxiety or immunization stress related responses. You see my point? So it's actually connected to those four. Now the next thing which is there is the green part. There is there any strong evidence against the causal association? It is connected to the green box here. And then if you just look at the last part for other qualifying factors, it is connected to the last box of the algorithm. Okay. Now when you look at these questions carefully, 
those questions you have to answer. Let me tell you something. Can any of you guess how long it took us to work to make this worksheet? How long did WHO take to make this worksheet? Yeah. It took us two years. Okay. It took us two years of sweat and blood and months. Okay. A lot of arguments and each word in that was dissected thread there before it reached this one. That is why we had major problems with translation. We had major problems with translation. I remember taking a workshop in Romania where WHO guys had translated this one to Russian and when they translated it into Russian, we should see the fights between the different groups because there are different ways in which Russian is interpreted there. You understand what I mean? So it is a big problem for us when we translate this because each word is so important and the, the way in which it has been designed is so, with so much interest, with a lot of difficulty. Now, how do you answer this? If you look into this particular page, huh? you will see you have to make only four answers here, okay? There is a yes, there is a no, there is unknown or not applicable. Can you see that? So there are only four answers. Now, mind you, the way in which the questions have been designed is... If you put a yes answer, if you put a yes answer, you should write the remarks. Is it clear? Mm. If you put a no answer or an unknown or a not applicable, if you want, you can give a comment. Is it clear? Yes. If you put a yes answer, it's mandatory to put the answer. That is why when we, we develop the software for this. You know why? Because people who are putting yes answer and not writing remarks. So right now, the way in which the software is designed is, if you put a yes answer, the computer will not let you move forward unless you put an answer. If the computer will come and tell you, hey guys, you better fill up that particular slot. Okay, so that is why we prefer, from WHO side, we prefer the software compared to the paper. But then it's up to you to use whatever you want. Because some countries still use paper forms and we are okay with it. Okay, so that is it. So this is how the this one is done. And then the last stage is the stage of uh, classification. Okay. Now, one more thing which you should do. I want you to read this last thing which is given in, yeah, in small font. Huh? The last box. You know, on the page two, there is a small box. Is there, right? So, there, it says, summarize the classification log logic in the order of priority. Okay. And then what is mentioned is, with available evidence. Understand? So, what we are again trying to say is, what you put, if you give junk, you will get junk out. You understand? We are, we are always being very, very clear that with the amount of information you provided, this is how the case can get classified. Right? So that is something you have to keep in mind. So this is how, so this is generally, to you understanding this uh, two pages is uh, quite important. Is there any questions on that? I'm happy to answer. Yes, please. I do Question on um, the number two, let's the events within the time window of the research, would that vary or is there kind of a set window? Brilliant question. Brilliant question. That is applicable to all. So if you see, let me show you what she's just trying to point out. So if you see, can you see this? Is it within the time window of increased risk? This, if you notice, is light blue and this is dark blue. So only if there is a yes. Answer to any of these questions about in the blue part, will this be applicable? Is it clear? Mm -hmm. For example, yesterday, let me give you an example, right? Like I'm giving her an injection, okay? I'm giving her, can you give me the pen? I'm giving her a shot, okay? I'm giving her a shot. As I give her a shot, as I pull out the needle, as I pull out the needle, she collapses immediately or she collapses after five minutes, after two minutes, or she collapses after 15 minutes. What will be the difference in the diagnosis there? What happens if, as I'm pulling out the needle, if she collapses, what do you think it could be? Yes. Correct. It could be an immunized, it could be a vasovagal attack. Understand? If it occurred after about one or two minutes, it is probably a substance like what I gave an example about Syria yesterday. You understand? Some substance which actually caused uh, asphyxia or something like that, which poisoned the kid. If it occurred after about 15 minutes or 20 minutes, it is probably anaphylaxis. You understand? So, you understand? So, this is what we mean by the time we know the increased risk. If you talk about VAC, if you talk about vaccine associated thyroid polio, the time interval for increased risk is 4 to 35 days. If you understand, if you talk about thrombocytopenia, it will be after about 10 days to 14 days. So, that is what we mean by the time interval of increased risk. Very good question. Any other questions, please?
Okay. If not, let's continue. And here we are. So when, once we go ahead with this, this is the causality assessment step. So the first step is you are looking for eligibility. Second one is checklist. The third one is algorithm. And the fourth one is classification. Now, why are we doing this? For, the, for eligibility, we wanted to determine that it satisfies the minimum criteria for causality. Okay? For the for a checklist, you wanted to systematically review the available information. Systematically. Now, the reason why I, I, you know, this red box, let me show you, was actually, I was just telling our colleague from Sri Lanka, it was actually developed in Sri Lanka. Do you know why? Because when we piloted this in the year 2013, 2014, I was going to Sri Lanka with this with different methods of probability assessment. So one of the senior people there, he looked at me very sarcastically and said, Mother, I know all this. What are you trying to tell me to do? You understand? That is when we realize it's important to get that red box ready, fixed. That is the causality question. Remember, getting that red box fixed is the crucial thing in doing the causality assessment. This is related to what I just told you earlier. That is, you are just trying to find out what is the hypothesis you are trying to prove or disprove. Right? So that is what it is. So that, that we have the checklist, then we want to have an algorithm, and in an algorithm you wanted to obtain a trend for causality, and then you are doing the final classification. So let us look at the eligibility. Now when you look at eligibility, what you need to do is, you need to make sure that the AEFI investigation is completed and all details of the case is available. Now, what happens in many countries, especially in the middle of COVID, they do piecemeal investigations. You understand what I mean? And then they would have said, okay, do the assessment with them. No. Before you do the assessment, the committee should certify saying, I'm satisfied that the documents available are sufficient for me to proceed with assessment. If you don't do that, then you cannot do the assessment. That's very, very important. The next thing is to identify one or two, one vaccine implicated or administered before this event. This is the question which came up yesterday. Now, simultaneously, you may get on one hand your uh, pentavalent vaccine, on another hand, you may get your BCG, on another hand, one drops, so you may get a few drops in your mouth and all that. But even if you go do multiple vaccines are administered, you can take, do causality assessment for only one vaccine at a time. Now, when you mean one vaccine at a time, it doesn't need one antigen at a time. You understand? So if you give pentavalent vaccine, you don't need to divide it into diphtheria, pertussis, blah, blah, blah. You'll have to do that one set of vaccines together. Is it clear? And then, so that is something you have to keep in mind. But you are, and you for each vaccine, you should do it separately. And the most important thing is actually the valid diagnosis. So you need to find out which is your unfavorable or unintended sign, lab finding, symptom or disease to where you wanted to determine causality. Now, you should also have a case definition, like the Brighton definition. If your Brighton definition is not available, you can use your textbook, like, you know, Nelson's textbook of pediatrics or something else, but you need to go with a standard definition. You can use a national definition. If you come across something totally new event, you can even think about a national new definition or any other approved definition by a group of people, by a group of approved people. So, when you look at eligibility, you must, as I said, it must be complete, uh, the investigation should have been completed, identify the vaccines, identify the lab uh, sign symptoms, and also the Brighton definition. Now, when you look at the causality question, look at that very carefully. Huh? This is the very tricky part of the whole thing. What are you asking? Has this vaccine or vaccination caused the event? So, what are you trying to find out? When you look at it, you are just trying to find out, has this vaccine caused hepatomegaly? Has this vaccine caused thrombocytopenia? Or has this, has the patient complained that the vaccine caused itching and redness, which is an example of a symptom? Or has the vaccine caused meningitis? Okay. The tricky part is, when you come across certain vaccines, like dengue vaccine, if it causes VA immunity, you will have to ask the question, did the dengue vaccine cause dengue? You understand what I mean? Yeah. Did the Dengue vaccine cause dengue? Understand? That is the main problem here. If you end up putting the wrong question here, you'll get the wrong answer to all the causalities. That's something you have to keep in mind. Right? Now, the next thing which you should, so, uh, which you should look at is, there is one important term here which you should understand. There is an important term here called an ineligible case. 
Okay. You should understand the difference between an ineligible case and an unclassifiable case. So we are not talking about an ineligible case. So what happens is, when you look at it, I told you, you know, when you are able to fill up the first part of the eligibility criteria, if you find sometimes the information which is not available is so poor, you know, the information you have is so poor that you cannot initiate causality assessment. So that is actually an ineligible case. Like, you know, sometimes I have seen some very poor uh, investigations. The name of the vaccine itself is not there. You understand? Then how can you do causality assessment? You cannot do anything. That is, then the next thing is, you may not, supposing if the investigation is incomplete, like you're waiting for lab result. If, the, if you're waiting for lab result, keep it temporarily as ineligible. Wait for the lab result and then start the assessment only after the lab results are there. Do not start the lab result beforehand. Otherwise, you should say it's ineligible and temporarily we are doing it. Later, we will change the classification, which can actually end up making a lot of problems in Okay, so this is something you have to keep in mind. Now, the next thing which you should do is look at the checklist. So, as I said, the checklist has got four, four uh, sections, and the answers to that, as since I explained, it's quite easy for you to understand now. You are actually dividing it. You are putting only the yes answers. You put the tick. If you put the tick in yes answers, you should always put the remarks. It's mandatory for you to write the remarks, okay? So, if you don't put the remarks in this yes answers here, you are actually going to have a problem. Now look at this algorithm. Now when you look at this algorithm, when you look at this algorithm, no, actually if you see, the algorithm is very simple. Right? Actually this is what the algorithm is. There are only four questions and these four questions are connected to the checklist questions. Correct? Now what does the algorithm say? The algorithm is only looking at S answers. You understand? Always the algorithm only looks at yes answers. And what does it do? It only talks about the trend in one direction. Let me show you that. So supposing if you get an S answer to the first questions, first bunch of questions, then the trend, the trend, see I'm using the word trend. I'm not using the word cause. The trend is inconsistent causal association. If you, if the, if the questions to the second bunch of questions is yes, the trend is consistent causal association immunization. The third one, if it is against this one, then the trend is inconsistent causal association. When you look at other qualifying factors, each of that answer should be reviewed separately and then you yourself will have to manually decide to put it into one of them. Is it clear? Right? So this is the algorithm. Right? Now let's go to the last part and this is the classification. So yeah, this is important. Huh? Again, I forgot to tell you this. Now, remember, this is where the word unclassifiable comes. So, supposing at this point, you are not yet able to make a decision, it will be unclassifiable. What is the meaning of that? I tried, I had enough amount of evidence. I went through this entire amount of evidence and still I am not able to classify it. So, then I will be putting it as unclassifiable. Right? So, that is what it is. Right. Now, when you just look at it, so, when you look at classification, you know, you need to say, first of all, the most important thing is adequate information available, and then all these things, it gets classified into product really consistent, inconsistent, or indeterminate. If adequate information is not available, then you would, uh, 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 not available, straight away you will just say, you are able to classify that as unclassifiable, and then you will be putting it out of the thing. Now, when you look at unclassifiable cases, what happens is, you are able to initiate an assessment. But during the assessment, the, the, the process, some key elements are unavailable to, to have a logical classification. Okay. So when you look at it, what does it mean? An eight month old infant with, uh, with an immunodeficiency disease presenting with fever, swelling, etc. And also with the BCG site swelling, which is, which is, which is swollen, it has got generalized lymphadenopathy and a scattered rash. But unfortunately, the child died before all investigations would be completed. Right? In that case, this case remains as unclassified. Right. Okay. Now, one more important thing, you know. So, you should understand, like, supposing as I am actually sitting here, coming here and taking this class here, in front of all of you. Suddenly, one of you gets up and asks a question, and if I collapse here and die, you cannot say, you know, this person asked a question, more than died. You understand? You will have to say, 
when this person asks the question, is a new in the brain of children any time, or he developed a heart attack any time, or he developed a stroke any time. You understand? So when you create the question, will be did this stroke kill him? So when you look at causality assessment, why I'm trying to tell you this is many times we have found that many forensic people, including forensic pathologists, they say that due to vaccination, it cannot take place. There must be an underlying cause why the person died. You understand? So you should say the aneurysm killed him or the stroke killed him. Then the causality question should be, did this vaccine cause the stroke? Did you understand? Not that did this vaccine cause the death. So that is how you have to change it. This is a very important concept you have to take, take home with you. Now the next thing, we have come towards the end of our session. Who should do causality assessment? Ideally, it should be a team which is independent. You remember yesterday I said, you know, the EPI program and the regulators should not be part of the committee. They can be like lawyer. They are okay. We are going to a jury. This AEFI committee is like a jury. You are going to the jury and providing them with the documents. But then you should fight your case. You understand? But the decision is made by the independent jury and not by the EPI program. The jury there should have strong expertise like infectious diseases, epidemiology, microbiology, pathology, neurology, etc. Now we are including people after COVID like, you know, geriatric uh, population, uh, obstetrics and gynecology. So many people, we are also including them. It should have a very clear terms of reference. You can use an existing drug causality assessment team, but they need to be trained for vaccines. Now, so the main part, just remember that this is almost the last part of my slides. The main part is actually the valid diagnosis. The first conclusion may not be final. Now, you should remember something, you know, when you look at causality assessment, when you look at this checklist, for instance, and when you do the final classification, when you do the final classification, you can put check boxes for multiple things. You don't need to put check boxes only for one thing. Is it clear? And we, and we always see, if, like when you look at your, as a clinician, when you talk about chest pain, a cause of chest pain can be lesions in the skin, costochondral junction, it can be pleura, pericardium, etc., etc. So same thing when you look at causality assessment, there can be multiple reasons for that. So you need to prioritize that. So the first conclusion can change and then the causality can also change. So when you look at multiple vaccines in the same patient, each vaccine should be assessed separately. If you get multiple AEFI in the same patient, each event should be assessed separately. And when you look at a cluster, each patient in the cluster should be assessed separately, right? So what can go wrong? This is the last slide, I hope. Causality assessment is not done, not systematic, not done by trained people or not done on time. And then sometimes the rookiot is so limited that you cannot do it properly. Sometimes, you know, many of the countries, especially, you know, this is what happens in many countries, which we see in Africa. They have, they lack expertise, activity committees who are doing a form, formal causality assessment is very difficult. Sometimes the data is not used and also there may be lack of communication of the findings, sometimes lack of uh, diplomacy or cultural sensitivity. So the law, this uh, causality assessment scheme, actually what happens is it is very simple. It is very convenient. It uh, uses the CIOMS guidelines and all that. And uh, it is a uh, major criteria for affecting causality. Now, more, one important thing is, please remember, causality can change. Like TTS before January 2022 was classified as indeterminate. Now it will be classified as a vaccine product-related reaction. Intersusception is now classified as a vaccine product-related reaction if it is connected to rotavirus vaccines. Do you understand? So earlier it is classified as indeterminate. So that one changes. So I think I'll stop there and... Uh, this is the last slide. Thank you. Yes, please. I just want to understand a little bit. In part of the criteria, you said you need an investigation report in order to go ahead into to do the causality. But you also said it can be unclassified if there is no investigation report. So I'm a little confused because if you need to go to the causality, you need the no, report. No, in that case, it will become ineligible. If the investigation report is not available, yeah. it will go into ineligible. Okay. If the investigation report is available and all documents are available, then it will be you review it and still you are not able to classify. In that case, you will be classifying it as an unclassified. Yeah. Yes, please. Yeah, thank you. My next question is from the academic box. Can you write? 
the question on the red box, the question of uh, yeah, eligibility. So when you're generating it, do you use the, the trade name of the vaccine or a non appropriate name? For example, will you say the uh, mRNA COVID vaccine caused this or you say the yes. Pfizer mRNA caused this? Very good, the trade name or the, the vaccine with the within brackets for the generic product. You understand what I mean? Because what we need to do is that when somebody does a causality assessment, between products itself, there might be some differences. You understand? Between, for instance, between Moderna and the Pfizer mRNA vaccines itself, there is a, there is a big difference between the, what it is. Because they even, even things like, you know, what temperature it will get stored, what temperature, even though it may be a platform, might be. I didn't think that there might be a difference. So you of course use the, the brand name within brackets, you can always put it. You learn it when you are doing the software. That will be a teaching Right? Yes, please. Yeah. Um you you said this thing about you could have a situation where you had dengue vaccine causes dengue. But for some vaccines, you have an adverse event of vaccine-enhanced yeah, disease. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and sometimes you see that during the cl clinical development programs, and that is um, manageable. And sometimes you don't see it, and then you put it into the risk management plans as an important potential. Uh, yeah. Yes, but it's so difficult to qualify that when you get post-marketing reports whether it's vaccine enhanced disease or whether it's just vaccine failure. How do you do that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because that is just it's just it's impossible to to narrow in. I was hoping for it. <laughs> Blew up. I was actually, I had to go and answer on behalf of WHO to Philippines. It was one of the most difficult AEFI committee meetings I ever attended. Mm. Yeah, I'm sorry, but I cannot give you an answer about that. Anyone else? Yes, please. In the immunization program, when you're giving multiple injections right. on the same vaccination visit and someone comes with an AEFI, which needs, like, how do you now? determine is it the IPV, is it the pentavalent, is it the PC? How do you go about that kind of an investigation? So you should be putting the same causality question for each of those things. Okay. Separately. Okay. Okay. And then doing the assessment separately. Mm -hmm. And then only you can do it. You cannot mix up all the vaccines together. Similarly, if you get a cluster of cases, you should, this is also sometimes very difficult, you may get a cluster of 20 cases, you should do the causality assessment for each of those cases in the cluster separately. I'm sorry, we can't. It's, there's no shortcuts to that. If the 20 cases have the same symptom, should yeah, you? Then we should do it because we have found out, like, for instance, uh, there was this episode where we started getting cases of meningitis in Bhutan, for instance. And uh, what happened was it, it occurred all over the country. And when we did the assessment separately, we found out that it is coincidental, but because of different causes. You understand? It may be reported around the same time, but. The etiology with similar clinical manifestations might be different. Yes. Sorry. The last question. This this question two was the event in section two within the time window. Correct. What is the time window we we we, we say for vaccination? How so it varies from vaccine to vaccine and circumstances. You remember I gave you the example regarding the uh, uh, fainting or anaphylaxis or lack. So it varies. There is actually a table which, to some extent. Again, it's not very accurate, uh, but to some extent, gives you the time it Yes, please. So, you know, I, I think you made a really good point about the indeterminate and the unclassifiable, like when you don't have enough. Image, and yes, classified. yes. Um, and, but sometimes you just don't have either the right information or enough information. How do you manage, like, the need to wait? Because sometimes people are like, I want this now, I want this now, tell me. How do you manage that? Okay, let me give you an example. So, supposing if you develop anaphylaxis in the United States, for instance, they would insist on serum context, right, for making a classification. But if it happens, for instance, in uh, Kalikanayak and Balian village, in Tondamakur block, in Coimbatore uh, district, and if they are doing an assessment in Bangladesh district in my place, 
you don't wait for the serum to place. So that is why we are saying in, those, in that particular circumstance, you are certifying that the information is sufficient. So before you, in fact, when you start using the software, you realize we are, you are also making a certificate. You are certifying that you are satisfied with that amount of available information. If you are not, if you say I am not satisfied, straight away the case goes into ineligible. So first you should say under the available circumstances. So if I'm doing the classification in Coimbatore and of access, I will look at it in terms of the clinical features rather than to wait for the serum tryptase result. Whereas if you are looking at it in the United States, I will say let's wait for the serum tryptase result before I do the classification. Right. Any other questions? No more. Wonderful. Thank you very much. So I'm glad that I finished my part of the talk. Now it's over to you guys. Yes. In addition to that table that has the time frames, is there a table with all the expected adverse events for all the vaccines in the immunization okay. program? If you look at, we cannot give you all the adverse events. For instance, hmm. what happens would be, and also finding out the time frame is not very easy, like what happens. Because again, you should ask, people keep on asking us, why can't WHO tell us this? Honestly, we don't know the answer unless there is someone published who published it. Then we take the publications and then only we bring out our publications based on the world's publications. You understand what I mean? And that also we should be sure that some anti-vax lobby guy doesn't publish something because then we'll be in trouble to say that stuff. So this, so when we look at uh, uh, look at this, we have a generic idea, and it's if you just look at the, there is something called uh, harmonia, H A R M O N I A. Okay. So if you want, you can send me an email and I can, this is the generic stuff which we have developed uh, very, in quote unquote, quite informally to help countries to develop the national AEFI guidelines. So if you want, you just send me an email, I can send you the template for Harmonia, which you can customize it to whichever country you want. The word Harmonia needs to be replaced in case Lesotho wants it. Find Harmonia, replace with Lesotho and you'll get the Lesotho guidelines. And that will be the starting point to start your guidelines. Many countries have started using that because then it becomes very easy for them to develop their guidelines. That has got a table which will tell you that. Yes, please. It was a very enlightening uh, like session for me. Uh, I just have a question. Like in our country, like we are also giving vitamin A in the right. nine months. Right. So there may be some other uh, like related adverse events related to vitamin A. So will it also count, count in when... Absolutely. So one of the questions you can also ask here in other qualifying factors you, if you just look at the questions, it's included in that. Okay. Yes. Hi. Uh, I, I'm a weekly, I'm, I work actually for pharmaceutical, but so I have a question for you. It's not completely clear to me yet. On the different levels of AEVI assessment, right? Like, how are these investigations done? Because, I mean, ideally, Right, you think, oh, somebody goes there and somebody talks to the people and somebody, you know, has everything, like maybe even to the patient and the nurses and can do some, but that's not how it works, right? Can you put up the slide, please? So, my slides, yeah. For example, I'll have this question. Okay, great. So we have, you know, we have just, you know, just that said, I mean, we have a certain process in the big pharmaceutical, how that works and, you know, they're separate teams. But then also, for example, the COVID, right? Then the, um, the U.S. has the um, vaccines adverse events reporting system, but there is no real. I mean, this is all like kind of somebody sends you a letter, and then somebody says, "Can you please fill in another kind of information?" But from my understanding as a physician, there's a certain degree. You know, you get information, but it's not the same as if I'm there and I'm doing the investigation, I'm doing the talking and so forth. So what really happens? Yes. Uh, so can you... Until the slides come here... It's not changing. Uh, until the, uh, the slides come, I think that the pharmacovigilance studies is very important. Pharmacovigilance? Studies by the manufacturer as a passive information is very important when something Absolutely. serious Absolutely. happens. The, the casualty, the casualty uh, assessment, for example, uh, in the casualty assessment meeting, the representative from the manufacturer, from the Ministry of Health, from the FDA, from the advisory committees, all of them come here and get data and they assess what is happening. Right. So that is why when you look at it, one more and then stop. Yes. Okay. When you just look at this, this is how the uh, investigation takes place. 
Okay, so what will we investigate? We only investigate death, serious AEFI cases like just I just told you right now. That's pretty straightforward. Second step is basically the district authorities and experts feel that an investigation can be done locally. They visit the locality and do the detailed investigation. And as I told you, we divide it into two categories, concise and comprehensive. Yeah. This I'm talking about comprehensive investigations. Concise investigations are usually done by the district immunization officer filling up this investigation form. Okay, I'm going to share that with all of you. So this particular thing will be filled up and then they will be doing this assessment. We will we'll, we'll be completed for concise ones. If it is comprehensive ones, in addition to this, they will insist on all the clinical records. And then what they do is, they will, uh, uh, during the field visit, this is what they do. They identify and rule out programmatic errors, ISRRs, coincidental events, and other events which could manifest. This is done for COVID, for instance, like what you asked. For deaths, you know, national investigations are done by a team by the national level which visits the EPI program and the NRA will be supported by them, but it is not a part of the investigation team. And then once what is done is they rule out again programmatic errors and ISRRs. And then during field investigations, they use some software. We other, if you just go to Google, there is an AEFI investigation software, which will help you to identify what kind of questions to ask for that investigation. And then once it goes into the committee, the committee sits and discusses the findings and then it arrives at a final conclusion. You don't look convinced. Well, I don't, I don't know. Do you actually know how that it's like, yes, you know, in terms of the initial step? I mean, much of that is just like, it's letter, it's a letter that's being sent. And then again, like, do you have any new information? And it's like, no, I don't have any new information. Like, John, John actually works on our affairs. Oh, yeah. uh, maybe, I don't know if you can hear us, John. Are you there? Yeah. I can hear you all. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, John, can you maybe explain how that works for the VRS that, you know, like the initial step, like the, how, when you get an SAE reported, like how does the, the, the investigation really looks like? You're just, you're sending a, a letter to the reporter in order to get some more information. You're picking up the phone, calling them. You're sending somebody there. How does it look like? Okay, well, just to be clear up front, um, the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, or VAERS, does not actually investigate causality. What happens in the case of a serious adverse event, and the U.S. does have a legal definition of what constitutes a serious adverse event, which is very similar to what's been described in uh, class lecture, um, what will happen is that VAERS will get in contact with the person filing the VAERS report, and try to kind of obtain more information. Um, and so what that will entail is obtaining contact information, then reaching out to the patient's clinical provider, reaching out to the hospital uh, for medical records, if that's where uh, the patient was hospitalized. In the event of a death, we'll reach out to vital statistics bureaus to obtain death certificates and autopsy reports. Essentially, VAERS reaches out to get as much information, additional information as it can about this particular patient. Now, once those records are within VAERS, um, depending upon the situation, those records um, will undergo greater scrutiny. Uh, in some cases, like during COVID, we actually had teams of people who would perform clinical abstraction from those into a uh, abstraction form that has selected data elements. And then all that data would be used for analytic purposes, um, but we never use that information for causality assessment, in part because the VAERS is a passive surveillance system, and generally you don't want to be using a passive surveillance system or the data from it to make any assessments regarding causality. It's just there are too many reporting biases and other issues. Um, so that's just a brief nutshell of how VAERS operates. Okay, well, th thanks. That clarifies. I was not aware that you go to that detail of getting the information. Thanks. Sure. Okay. Thank you very much. So I will go to the next part of the session because otherwise we will be going on sitting here forever. It's already 3.30 today. I can't believe that the time flies. Okay. So as I said, we are going to the second part of the part of talk here. Uh, in fact, uh, what I would do is can I request you to please you know, help us out with the second part? Because what we are going to do, can you guys all open your laptops? Can you go to open your laptops and then Ritu is going to just take us through this. Uh, and I'm going to, uh, you know, you got the sample case, right? Which I just provided. 
Like in case any of you want it, I can again send it to you. <laughs> so what is going to be happening is you will do the causality assessment using the software yourself with Rito in the loop. Okay. Right? All right. Anyone wants a copy of this? Anyone want to copy yeah. of this? Yeah. Okay. Yes, I So, did everybody get to the, the website? Okay, great. And then I think you're supposed to put it in a real case, otherwise, we'll send you to the train. Well, it's not this And then, uh, and then um, and then I can, I can just read the case and we can go along and, and fill out things on the, okay. on the, on the website. Okay. <laughs> Do you want me to do the case too? Oh, so okay. Yeah. 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 So, you know, the idea is we want you to learn the process. We are not interested in the finance. Now, just look at what she's typing on. She's just typing on AEFI causality assessment software. So, just type on AEFI causality. Now, you're spelling this thing. Causality. This is a French thing. Oh, my God. It's a, there it is, causality assessment software. Software. Okay. Oh, 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 yeah. No. This is so French. Yeah. Okay. Software. Ah, oh, there it is. Yeah, there we go. Okay, okay have you got okay. causality assessment software? Yeah. Okay, yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, there is something called GVSI, AEFI tools. Now, can you see this? There is an e-learning course here. Can you see that one? So, if you can, you any, can you just click on that read Uh-huh, sure. So this gives you the entire WHO's vaccine safety e virtual e-learning system. Okay, there is causality assessment, data management, investigation, vaccine safety basics. Okay, you will have to just get registered. You can get a certificate for each of those courses as well if you complete it. Okay, so back please. Okay. All right, so we're going to click here to no, assess. No. Okay. Okay. Oh, I'll go to the story first. Okay. All right. So, M.A. is a male child born on 29th December 2006 to a farmer couple in a polio endemic country. On 1st July 2009, he suddenly developed inability to use his left upper limb. This was reported by the local health worker to the medical officer on the same day and investigated on 2nd July 2009. The medical officer obtained the details of the present illness from the parents. M.A. had a sudden onset of flaccid paralysis in the left arm on 1st July. On the day of the paralysis, there was no fever. The paralysis was static, neither ascending or descending. There was no sensory loss. He did not travel outside of his locality for 35 days preceding his illness. There was no history of trauma, no loss of consciousness, and no convulsions. Within four weeks prior to the paralysis onset, he had fever and vomiting, for which he was given injections in the gluteal region by a private practitioner. M.A. had a BCG scar. The health worker mentioned that M.A. had received three doses of OPV through routine immunization, and the parents mentioned that he had over 10 doses of OPV through mass immunization campaigns. The last OPV before paralysis onset and stool sample collection was administered on 7th June 2009. On clinical examination, the medical officer observed that the tone was markedly diminished in the left upper limb. There was power of 0 over 5 in the muscles of the wrist, forearm, and upper arm. The biceps, triceps, and supinator jerks were diminished. Examination also showed that all other limbs were clinically within the normal range of expected findings. Using a measuring tape, he determined and recorded the circumference of all the limbs. 
to test for the presence of enterovirus, two stool specimens were collected on 2nd July 2009 and 4th July 2009. Each specimen was of adequate volume and sent to a WHO accredited laboratory in good condition, in good condition without desiccation, liquid, and with the adequate documentation and with evidence of the cold chain maintained. The second stool sample isolated Sabin type 1 and type Sabin type 2 strains of poliovirus. The medical officer re-examined MA on 9th September 2009 and observed that the tone was diminished in the left upper limb compared to the right. There was improvement in the power in the muscles of the wrist, 4 over 5, forearm 2 over 5, and upper arm 2 over 5. The biceps and triceps supinator jerks were still diminished. Examination also showed that all other limbs were clinically within normal range of expected findings. On measuring the limbs, he determined that there was wasting in the left upper arm. Okay, so should we go through now and do the, the causality assessment? Okay. All right, so, so I think we have to click, do you want to assess a real case? Because we are going to come back and do the e-learnings. Okay. So what is what you see on the second screen here? You are having a second screen, so I'm actually going to give you instructions in parallel here. Okay. So what you're seeing on the second screen here will you know, simply happen in parallel to what the brief was stated, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. So this is where you're right now. Okay. Yeah. All right. And then um, and so right, then we click through the yeses on everything, right? Yes. There we if go. you happen to click a no, then it becomes ineligible. Okay. Okay, if you click a no, then it goes, takes a different track and it becomes quite ineligible as uh, like this. Can you see this on the smaller screen? If you can you see the smaller screen here? So if you just happen to throw in a no response, then it moves into a different screen altogether called an ineligible screen. I'm sorry, Peter, you cannot see that. Oh, that's okay. Right I, I can actually see it over here. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, please proceed. Yeah. Okay. So, the, so we'll fill this out quickly. The assessor name. French. <laughs> okay, and then the name of the patient, MA. Okay, and the unique ID, we could just put anything here, right? Okay. Okay. And then the date of birth is. 29 December. And then mail. And then what are the documents available for assessing? Now, is this a completed case form? I guess it's not really a no, completed I think case you form. Can just put, uh, uh, yeah, you can just put, uh, I think there's an option for other, no? Isn't there? Oh, other. Okay. Okay. You can put partially completed or not. Okay. You can put partially completed or not. Okay. As I said, this is, we are not really very interested in activism. But it's difficult for me. It is okay. It's okay. <laughs> and the quality of these documents, um, I think we say it's pretty good. It's excellent. Average. Average. <laughs> I say good. Okay. All right. And then, um, Name of the vaccines administered before this event. So we have information about the OPV, right? So I think it's just the OPV. Does, do we see other vaccines too? Or it was just... Well, it's it's polio vaccine trivalent, right? Yes. Yes. So oral polio vaccine trivalent. Okay. And the brand name is unknown, right? We don't know. And then is... What is a valid diagnosis? Valid this is the tricky question. Mm. Correct, correct. Yeah. Yeah. 
Oh, actually, we don't know. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, it doesn't say that it's. So it's an acute flaccid paralysis. Like, uh, is there Shijana a was suggesting. Is that okay with everyone? Acute flaccid paralysis? Yeah. Okay. And then, is, does the diagnosis meet a case definition? Yes. Can you see the globe which is rotating there? Do you know what that is? Can you click on that globe? You saw that. It, go, it takes you to the Brighton Definition website. Nice. Okay. Okay. So you can then search and pick up whatever di case definitions you want. Let's not do that now. But then I'm just kind of giving you an information that it Very takes helpful. you to the Brighton Definition websites. And all your def case definitions can be picked up immediately. Okay. So, Madhav, in your expert opinion, this, this fits the Brighton Collaboration Definition? Yes. 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 Okay. No, 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 you need to just put uh, uh, just put the uh, XXX there, you know, just for the present judge for that. But ideally, you should write out the right you can copy definition. from there and paste it from the there. right. Okay. okay, so you need to go to the Brighton website, copy the definition, and paste it. Or if you don't decide to do the Brighton definition, uh, you can even put other definitions, whichever you want, but put a definition. Okay, okay, all right. So, are you satisfied that the causality question is correct? Yes. Yeah, if you put no, then you'll be in deep trouble, huh? That yes. Is, because then it'll make you redo the whole thing. Yes. Now, now, so the step one, is there strong evidence for other causes? Mm -hmm. In the patient, does the medical history, clinical examination, or investigations confirm another cause for acute so it doesn't confirm another cause, right? So, I mean, something happened, he got these four other injections, but but this is fairly consistent with the case definition. So I'm going to say no. And also because if we say yes, we have to write something. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Everyone agrees? <laughs> okay. Now, one uh, thing which you, if you notice, what does, what did the software do? The software actually put in that word acute flaccid paralysis from where you entered into the question. Did you see that? Yeah. Yes. So the beauty of the software is it regenerates the question and converts it to ordinary English. Yeah. You understand? Because otherwise it would be the word acute flaccid paralysis would be replaced by the word event. Okay. So if you look into your yeah. your your uh, worksheet on causality assessment, it will say event. So it's replacing that word event with the word acute flaccid paralysis. So whatever you type there, so it's you, it's very easy to for you to work on that. Okay. Oh. Okay, can uh -huh. you read the next question, please? Okay, so is there evidence in published liter published peer-reviewed literature that this polio vaccine oral trivalent may cause such an acute flaccid paralysis if administered correctly? And so shall I click the globe? Yes, please. Okay. So you can, uh, oh, it takes nice. you to the okay. vaccine reaction rates information yeah. sheets. So if you just look at it, you can actually open the polio vaccine rate sheet. Is that... Can you go down? Can you go down? Okay. Oh, sorry. So there is different vaccine rate sheets. Can you see that? There must be a polio vaccine rate sheet. There it is on the right side. On the right, right here. Okay. If you hear that, the problem, I don't know. No, no, no. Ah, yeah. Yes. Okay. So so you this, yeah. So you can always find that there. Oh, uh, like, okay. So you can always say, so you see what I mean? Right. Oh, this is nice. No, no, no. You go back, go back, and uh, oh, go down, go down. Oh, and it has the case definition also. Absolutely. It's, yeah. it's a huge volume of information. We are now working on the polio vaccine sheet right now. Oh, awesome. Does anybody see the rate? No, that is not when they just see. Okay. Does it cost? Okay. Yes. Does it cost? So we'll just say yes. Yeah, so there's definitely. Now we have the comment. Yeah. Can you see how you were telling us the last time it came out? Did you notice? Did you notice? This yeah. box came in green. No? Yeah. If you put no unknown or one, you can put the box will come in green. If you put yes, it will come in red. If you insist on entering the mark. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes. 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 Yes.
Is there a biological possibility that this polio vaccine oral OPV trivalent could cause such an acute flaccid paralysis? Yes. Yes. Very nice. Okay. In the lungs, you can say it can cross membrane barrier or something like that. Okay. Okay. All right. Now, in this patient, did a specific test demonstrate the causal role of the polio vaccine? Yes. Right. Yes, you, you actually it isolated it from the stool. Sabin type one, no? Okay. Yes. Sabin type one and two isolated from stools. Hey, it's John. I'm going to ask a naive question here. So the patient is administered um, oral vaccine. He's shedding oral vaccine. How do we know that the two are causally, that that and the AFP are causally related? No, that is what we are trying to uh, to assess. You know, we are not trying to say, uh, we, are, we are saying that if the, see, if you just looked at the WHO classification of uh, of uh, polio. If you just look at it, uh, there is a, a classification which says that uh, if there is a stool, if it is isolated, and if there is residual paralysis, then it causes paralysis. There okay. is a classification scheme. I, uh, it is there actually in the red book of uh, AFP surveillance. It is mentioned there. Okay, thanks. Okay, and then um, could the polio vaccine given to the patient have a quality defect or is substandard or falsified? How would you say that? I mean, I guess we don't know, but yeah. So, so I guess I would say unknown there, right? Okay. All right. So now it goes to the next one, immunization error. Just okay. a quick announcement. Yeah. You have yes. only another 15 minutes and the bus leaves in 15 minutes. Okay. Okay. I was informed about that. Sorry. Okay. All right. We will go very fast. <laughs> in this patient, was there an error in prescribing non-adherence to recommendations? Yes, right? Because he got 10 doses or maybe 13 doses. No. No? He did, but I think the current policy when they're doing don't necessarily want to check if they've got to write Okay. Like, you're not really... Well, necessarily not causing harm and problematic. Okay. Okay. So I will change it to no. Yeah. yeah. You know what? Let us quickly finish off the process because you need to understand what will happen. I need okay. to help you to generate a PDF document here. Okay. So in okay. the patient. Yeah, even if it is very inaccurate, it's okay. We need to quickly finish. Okay. Otherwise, we'll have a problem. I'll just assume no, right? Yeah. 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 For all of these. Yes. It's okay. Don't worry about that because okay. I want to help you to understand the process. Yeah. Okay. All right. So now we go to immunization anxiety. So no, right? Uh, okay. And then. The answer to that is yes. yes. It's yes. Okay. So as I said, it is within 4 to 25 days. But then yes. it can be occurred within 23 days of paralysis. No? Occurred within 23 days of paralysis. Occurred within 35 days of paralysis. Okay. Yes. 35 days of vaccination. All right. Very good. Next. Okay. Next. Okay. Is there a strong evidence of causal relation? Yes. Against. against. Oh, against. Oh, no. Sorry. Okay. And then other qualifying factors. So we didn't have this, right? No. 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 Okay. Unknown. And then unknown, right? Unknown. Unknown in this one? Yeah. No, no, no. no, no. I just know. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Could this, be it, yes, the answer yeah. to that is yes. Yeah. Could it could, could have been a background break? You can mention other causes for paralysis. Other causes for paralysis. For paralysis. And then the, the question four is, did the patient have an answer to that is yes, because yeah. was given an injection previously for uh -huh. unknown illness, injection, okay. other illness, in other injection given, just, yeah. yeah. Given. Okay. Something yes. Like uh -huh. Okay. okay. All right. This one would be, the next one would be unknown. Question unknown. five would be unknown. Yes, because we don't know. Okay. And uh, 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 this again would be unknown. No? Unknown. Yes. 
Okay. 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 Watch very carefully. Yeah? This is important. You can see it is now generating the algorithm. Can you see? Yes. That? Yeah. Now, what you need to do is, I just want to show you what it does. So, this thing is auto-generated, like what you see on yeah. the, uh, under 2A. But again, if you just look at the top, or, you know, Rito, can you just uh, uh, take a uh, copy that you take your mouse to other causes for paralysis? Yeah. And drag it and put it under inconsistent. Bring it under inconsistent. Okay. The green box. Oh, under you know the, that? yes. Uh, okay. Correct. Okay. Correct. Yeah. Uh -huh. Correct. Very good. Okay. Other injection given, that also, can you bring it and bring it yeah. to the green box? Bring oh, it. Oh, nice. Okay. Oh, so, wow. yes. And then click okay. on next. Did you see what, what she did? Yeah. Then you click on next. Yeah. Right. Now, oh. this is your causality classification. Okay. Now, remember, if you put any answers within your unknown, so that, like, how these are going to be and drawing that's the idea. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah. okay. We just make oh, this is really nice. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, have you finished? All of you finished? Yeah. I'm just thinking about making five minutes. I'd like to maybe yeah. like the battery yeah. for coming to town. Okay. okay. So, no, if you want to leave, you can. No problem. Okay. So, now what happens is, can you, one important thing at this stage would be, like, you can move this up and down. Huh? You can actually move these boxes from green to yellow, or yellow to green, and all that. Okay. You can move it according to what you want, but let's just click as next. Oh, can yeah. you see that? Okay. Yeah. 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 So you can move it, and then you click on next. Yeah. Yeah. So what you need to do is, can you click on the red box here on the top called classify? Yeah. And then, so it is a, is it a vaccine? If it crosses the blood brain barrier, is it a vaccine product related reaction? Yes. Yes. So can you drag the cross the blood brain barrier and bring it to the central box? See, this dragging was not working for me yesterday. I think no, there's I, something fine. No, no, no. It's very simple. One okay. minute. Can I help you? Yeah. So you just come here, uh, drag yes. it and bring it this here. Oh, okay? okay. So I'm just dragging it and bringing yeah. it here to make it easy for you. Yeah. Right? And then I click on next. Same. There is, you put one as indeterminate yeah. here. No, no problem. So then you just put next and then this is also next then you need to click on this so now you have two options here one is your uh, uh, this one like vaccine can you put number one here vaccine product related reaction this one yeah yes put number one one yeah and then put number two here for coincidental okay. no in this box. how do we get these numbers to work i'm sorry this one put yeah, a number yeah. here you just need to type yeah. out two see it's harder than it looks <laughs> no it's two that's because of the computer, I think. Yeah. He does that here too. Ah, uh, I see. Ah, uh, okay. This is a problem. Ooh, this was so different. And, I bet you. Okay. 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 So now next. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. So now this is your causality classification. And just quickly, so you know, can you click on the, uh, uh, put the PDF report? Yeah. And then you'll be able to get a PDF report. Can you click on the PDF report below? Yes. So that is your final report. I'm sorry, guys. I had to hurry you guys up on the last part. Okay. Can oh, wow. Look at that. So oh, very nice. Important thing, an important announcement. None of this is stored in the server. Okay. None of the data is stored in the server. WHO only monitors one thing. Which countries are using this? Because we wanted to know how many countries, how many hits that we monitor. We use a Google Analytics to analyze that data. But nothing what you put up is because this is confidential data. We respect uh, their country privacy and we allow you to use it according to what we want. Right? I think, uh, sorry about no. the hurry towards the end, but uh, we have more options. Mm -hmm. No, this is great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.